and a very warm welcome to this programme across our planet. The mass movement of refugees and migrants is a story of human tragedy and political crisis, perhaps ineptitude. Well, thanks to climate change, there could be much worse to come. This is Roundtable. Hello from me, David Foster. Take three regions of the world in particular, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia. The World Bank has predicted 140 million people in those areas could be forced from their homes by climate change in the next 30 years. Climate-related displacement could be one of the gravest challenges created by our warming planet. For the latest in our series 2020 vision, we're asking if we are prepared for a world of climate refugees. The concept of climate refugees is still new, but as global warming impacts us all, the role it will play in future human migration is often underestimated. Last year, climate-related factors resulted in the displacement of around 16.1 million people. Climate change disproportionately impacts developing countries, and more specifically, fragile states. It's estimated that by 2050, between 150 to 200 million people are at risk of being forced to leave their homes as a result of desertification, rising sea levels, and extreme weather conditions. International law governs only political refugees, those who are fleeing persecution, and does not extend to climate refugees. We're living through a time when states are increasing border security and are worried about threats to their national security. But with increasing numbers of people forced to flee because of climate change, how will these climate refugees be protected? And will governments be able to cope? Very pleased to say that joining us from London in the UK, we have Aisha Siddiqui, lecturer in human geography, who works with communities in the global south affected by climate change and lectures at Cambridge University. We go to Washington, D.C., say hello to Errol Yaiboke, a development expert who believes that agencies do need to spend more on climate adaption programs. And then in Brussels, we welcome Alexandra Stiegelmeier from the European Stability Initiative, who says we really haven't seen any evidence of climate refugees yet. Uh, welcome to all three of you. Alexandra, let me come to you first of all, because it's quite controversial. There have been so many headlines about people who've been displaced by uh, freak weather conditions, uh, human encroachment, rising sea levels, etc., etc. And you say there are no such things yet as climate refugees. And I say things in the sense of it being an amorphous mass, but of course it isn't. It's people. Uh, what I mean is there is no def um, evidence of a climate refugee in the sense of there is evidence that a specific person was displaced by climate change. Yes, we have an increase in extreme weather events, but it's very difficult to say this particular uh, storm or this process of desertification or sea level rise is caused by climate change. And as a matter of fact, there is no definition for climate change refugee yet. Well, I'm, that's something so, we're going to get into yeah, in, in just a moment. But I, I would point to one particular area of the world, uh, Bangladesh. The capital, Dhaka, sea levels there are rising. Temperatures are also going up, which means there'll be more uh, snow melt from the Himalayas, which means that there'll be less land mass. Um, there is a problem there with climate migrants. Let's call them climate migrants, I think, rather than refugees. You, you, you don't think there is evidence that this is caused by uh, climate change? No, I fully believe in climate change, but the nature of climate change is um, that the sum of events provides the evidence that there is climate change. But you can never say that this particular storm or this particular whatever sea level rise has been caused by climate change because, of course, there are often also other factors, directly man-made factors, okay. deforestation, etc. And that makes it, of course, very difficult to say who is a climate refugee. OK, so, so I, I think what Alexandra is saying, I, I'm not trying to put words into her mouth, is she's saying, yes, there are people who may have been displaced by uh, climate change, but you can't be for certain, Aisha, that that is the real reason. And yet you've worked in, well, I know Pakistan, Philippines, 
uh, Colombia. I don't know whether you're familiar with what's happened in Bangladesh. I'm sure you probably are. Is there any doubt in your mind that these people are climate migrants if they have to flee their homes because of what's happening? Um, I have to say I do um, fully appreciate where Alexandra is coming from, um, and I do and I do agree with that perspective because not only um, is it really difficult to identify a particular uh, natural hazard, a particular typhoon or storm or flood as being directly related to anthropogenic climate change, but additionally we also have plenty of evidence, um, lots of research studies, lots of evidence uh, on the fact that um, on the other side, not just on the side of natural hazards, but also on the side of people who are moving, when you ask them what it is that's making them move, it's rarely ever just the one factor, which is climate. It's a whole range of factors that come together, economic opportunities, various things that kind of... Um, come together to, to, to create wow. a situation where so, they decide, all right, we must, we must move. So, so, even, so are, we, are we saying that um, they are inadequately describing their situation themselves? Many of them poor, perhaps illiterate people who are asked to sort of categorize what has caused their predicament. I don't think it's, it's, quite, it's quite as simple as that. I think um, over... Uh, over uh, hyping or sensationalizing this idea that uh, it's climate that's going to result in mass kind of swaths of people moving into, um, you know, places we consider home in the West. I think uh, there is a, a, li a little bit of hysteria and sensationalism around that. I think there are 100% there uh, challenges that, that climate change is, is bringing on and already uh, creating in people's lives. But at the same time, to be really nuanced and really sensible in the way that the this issue is talked about is not something that we are seeing very often these days. Errol, let me come, and we'll come back to this um, idea of, of how do you classify uh, climate migrants in just a moment. But Errol, you, you, you are writing about this very matter at, at the moment. Do you want to share with us some of your thoughts, perhaps conclusions, if you've got that far? I haven't gotten to the conclusions uh, yet, but, but I just wanted to respond to a little bit of what I heard. And, and I don't want to be the sensationalist panelist here, but I think it's without a doubt that climate change is fundamentally changing a lot about our world. And more and more, we are going to see uh, the direct and indirect results of climate change being that more people are going to be on the move. Um, I, I think that assigning direct causality to climate change, sure, in some cases that might be difficult, but you have to think about climate mobility or climate migration or climate refugees. We'll talk about the status. But you have to think about that both in terms of the increased number of events, which Alexandra mentioned, and in terms of these slow onset issues, increased uh, amount of salt going into soil agricultural lands. You mentioned Bangladesh. I was in Bangladesh not too long ago. And there are people that live along the coastline that we're flooded every once in a while. Every few years, they'd get flooded and they'd have to go into Dhaka to the slums. And now that's happening cyclically. That's happening every year, sometimes twice a year, whenever the rains come. That's a fundamental shift. Now, is that a fundamental shift because there's more weather events? No, it's because climate change is fundamentally altering their uh, situation and, and sort of the climate around them. Does it really matter? Uh, let me come back to you, Alexandra, for this one. Does it really matter uh, how you label these poor people, whether you call them climate migrants, climate refugees, or whatever, um, because they are uh, an unidentifiable group in some way? They are not known as refugees because that requires persecution, that requires war under the UN uh, definition of it. It requires... Um, a fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, etc. They are effectively outsiders. And the point is, Alexandra, how do you make them part of the world community when they're facing these problems? I think this needs to be uh, happening in the fr framework of the UN Climate Change Conference. Because, of course, people are aware that certain countries will be disproportionately affected by climate change. And there are all the attempts to 
help them to adapt to mitigate effects, etc. And there's also a slow realization that um, this needs to be happening. But unfortunately, we are not yet at the stage that any action is taken. But, but this I has mean, been happening. Stop. This has been happening for a very long time. And if I can just take a look at one of the things uh, you actually mentioned, you said we need to revisit this perhaps in 10 years time. Uh, because I think if things get better, there could be discussions about how to deal with them then. Ten years' time. No, no, I didn't say ten years' time. What I mean is that, um, firstly, it's a question if somebody who is affected by climate change really goes on the move to the West, what we are talking about. I mean, the Bangladeshis that are affected might move just more inland because it's a fact that most people do not like to become refugees. And it's still better to move within your own country than to go onto this very uncertain journey abroad. And then even those who do go abroad, like 80% of all refugees, recognized refugees, I mean people that are considered refugees, go to neighboring countries. So it's only a very small portion that really tries to go to Western countries. And that, unfortunately, also costs money because but most people... Sorry to interrupt, Alexander. Others. What I'm suggesting is that these are real people and the initiatives that you suggest yeah. may be worth discussing in a different way in 10 years' time would be 10 years too late. Something needs to be done to address this at the moment. You talked about the, uh, the climate change conferences. Well, I mean, I've just taken a look at something called uh, the Nansen Initiative started in 2012 about these very people. And as of now, they're having meetings saying this is something we still need to discuss as part of the um, uh, climate change conferences around the world. That is eight years on. Nothing's being done about these people that is concrete. Yeah, I fully agree. There is talk. There's also like the Global Compact on Refugees, this big uh, agreement that was signed in Marrakesh in 2018, also mentions uh, migration as a factor of environmental degradation, climate change, but it does not move to any action. It's all like we need to study it more, we need to research, etc., etc. But this is um, the current reality. No one wants in the West, I mean, you know that the whole fight against climate change is not very effective at the moment. A lot of countries are blocking it. And uh, refugees are unfortunately not a very popular group of people either. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Aisha, let me come to you. This is for any of you, actually. I, I mentioned this Nansen initiative, eight years on, very little happening. Uh, what is happening with... Um, well, let me look at this. A press release in February of this year by the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on internal displacement on commencement of the panel's work. It says, uh, I bring attention to the continued issue of internal displacement and to provide recommendations for states, the United Nations systems and other stakeholders. Take notice of this. What do we need to do to make these people's lives perhaps better? Yeah. Um, I, I, again, I, I have to say I um, agree with a lot of what um, Alexandra was saying, because uh, in the work that I do, where I speak to um, a lot of communities who've been affected by hazard-based disasters like typhoons, floods, landslides, those kinds of, of, of things, um, the, uh, the response is never one where people are seeking kind of large-scale movement from wherever their home is to the West or to Europe or to whatever. In fact, in most cases, and again, we have evidence to support this, they're not even seeking to uh, cross borders, crossing a border and moving, um, you know, from uh, one part of the of, of the country to an entirely different country is really expensive. It requires all sorts of legal regulations, etc. Most of the movement that I've seen in my work and that we know uh, in terms of the evidence that's coming out is of people moving or trying to adapt adapt by moving internally within within borders or moving up to higher lands or moving to places yeah. um, where the government is declaring... Uh, are they uh, then classified as internally displaced? Yes, I think that in some ways is the... Is, 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 is for me a much more interesting discussion because those are the sorts of things, those are the kinds of political acts, calling somebody an IDP, an internally displaced person, or, or immediately kind of opens them up 
for or or makes it possible for them to receive particular kinds of uh, disaster relief that they would otherwise not be be entitled to it it makes them uh, it 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 brings them into the uh, particular kinds of of frameworks with the UNHCR etc and entitles them to particular kinds of support that they would otherwise not be entitled I'll, to hold that thought for just a moment because as i mentioned before the program just hold your hand up if you want to say something and Errol very politely did that didn't jump in um, but you did raise a finger and what is it you wanted to say yeah I, I think the the answer to your IDP question is a critical one and the answer is it depends some countries provide lots of support to internally displaced people but what you're seeing is the effects that we're talking about and the poor people is is disproportionately affecting poor people in poor regions of the world which oh by the way are also the places that are going to be hardest hit by climate change and so I wanted to just make a point, and this gets back to an earlier point, David, of we we tend to think about the UN and international institutions as really important, and they are. However, they're only as good as the countries that essentially adapt those ideas to national policy. So the UN can you know, scream until it's blue in the face about climate refugees, which for reasons that Alexandra and Aisha mentioned is not happening. I have thoughts on that too. But it's not going to matter until countries like Bangladesh, like the Philippines, like the United States, quite frankly, acknowledge the existence of climate change and deal with this in their national policies. And are you saying these countries are not doing anything about it, that they're sort of just pretending it isn't happening? I think it depends. Uh, I, don't, I don't know particularly about the ones that uh, I, I just mentioned, other than being here in the United States. Yeah. I think there are some within the Trump administration that have trouble acknowledging the existence of climate change, and that's Oh, yeah, 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 I, I, I know that, but I just wondered if you thought that countries such as Bangladesh, which has a problem with IDPs, if you want to call them that, um, is also denying that the reason why the sea levels are rising and temperatures are getting uh, higher is, is because of climate change. I don't have a good answer to that. OK. Um, I, Aisha, I will come back to Alexandra in just a moment, but Aisha, yeah. Uh, I, I do think that it's it's... It's a little bit more complicated than um, you know whether they're they're outright denying their existence or whether they're outright supporting them 100. percent I think there is um, there it, 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 it's it's somewhere in between. I think what I've seen in places like the Philippines is that the state is very much aware of uh, people who need to move, who need to be rehoused, who need who whose lives have been uh, devastated by uh, hazard-based disasters, but. They, they, the kinds of uh, interventions that, that states automatically come to are like, okay, let's lift this group of people from this area and move them willy-nilly nilly to another part of the country or to another part of the, of, of the same municipality or something. And people are also um, human beings with social connections, with kinship connections, etc. They don't just want to be picked up and placed without any kind of say in the matter. So I think having a much more a democratic system, a system that takes local communities' needs, their considerations, their wants, etc., into uh, any kind of yeah. future planning that's taking place is really what's lacking. That's what I haven't seen any evidence of. Uh, Alexander, uh, the, what, the World Bank's figure is 145 million. I have read elsewhere other people saying it could be as high as 1 billion. In, in your estimation, whether you call them climate migrants, climate refugees, or, or whatever, are all of these people fleeing because of unpleasant circumstances in their lives, or do you think some of them could well be economic migrants? But you are an economic migrant if you are fleeing because uh, your field has been submerged in water. Because well, but equally, no, I mean, you, you could so be fleeing you because you, you, you care about the health of your children, you could be fleeing uh, because your house has been sunk, etc., etc. Are they moving to make themselves better off, perhaps? Find a in quotes, better life elsewhere, rather than just trying to find safety? Uh, essentially, yes. I mean, we, even today, irrespective of climate change, we have a lot of people who live very, very bad lives economically and who are trying to move to Europe just to earn enough money to send their three kids to school in sub-Saharan Africa or support the mother who has cancer or AIDS or something. So if you have no livelihood and you're really among the poor, 
of course, you are automatically an economic migrant. And if climate change caused your poverty, you are still an economic I, migrant. I see what you mean. I, mean, I think, it's, I think it's fair to say, current... is it not? Okay, I, I, I do understand what you're, yeah. where you're coming from on this one. But is it not fair to say that at, in some quarters, calling somebody an economic migrant is a denigration? Yes, because only people who face political persecution or indiscriminate violence that uh, puts their lives at risk are entitled to asylum in Western countries or all the countries that have signed the Refugee Convention. So all the ones that are called don't have a reason, like poor Africans that come or came during the refugee crisis in great numbers to Europe, they are called economic migrants, which is, of course, unfair and should not denigrate them. Somebody who is really poor and can't send his kids to school and just wants to be able to scratch together $100 per month and send them home is um, not a bad person. Uh, but if you look from it at least from a legal point, these people do not qualify for asylum as it has been designed under the UN Convention for Refugees. Is there any way, and this is either for Aisha or for, or for Errol, Errol um, it seems to me that there are two sides to this uh, problem, uh, how to prevent it getting worse and how to help those who are already affected. Let's go to the first part, how uh, to prevent it getting any worse. Uh, is there any way to, to reverse it in places such as um, the Bengal Delta, areas like Dhaka and Bangladesh? Is it too late? Who wants to pick I'm that sure. one up? Would you, would you like yeah, Errol, to, uh, you, you go ahead with that one. Okay, I'll go ahead. So I, I think the answer is it's not too late. Um, there are some trains that have left the station vis-a-vis -vis climate change, but it's not too late to adapt. The human race is, is an adaptable race, and we, are, we can do more than we are doing. The problem is that, David, the focus has been on your second question and not on your first question. So we think a lot in the international community about responding to disasters and responding to people on the move. We don't have the capacity nor the time, nor the money to think about addressing some of the root causes. And that would, that would require, I mean, I'm not denigrating the people that are in the positions, that their jobs are hard, but doing so would require not only acknowledging the existence of climate change, it would be thinking, this, is a, this program's called Vision 2020, which is about the next decade. It would require policymakers to think over the next two to three decades. And that, with electoral cycles, is, as you can imagine, really hard. We need to be thinking more about bolstering early warning systems. We, you mentioned the Philippines before. They've actually done a really good job at this. We need to be thinking about anticipating problems that we know will happen and allowing people that are going to be forced to move to do so in a regular, safe, and orderly way. Right now, we're just kind of, oh, no, people are moving. What are we going to do about it? And that's not a strategy. Okay. Actually, yeah, you did want to say something, but I suppose uh, I, let me just summarize a little bit what Errol was saying. He says there's an ev inevitability about this, although it's not entirely too late. There is an inevitability that these catastrophes will continue. You just have to make uh, these climate migrants as safe as you possibly can in the circumstances. I think that um, saying something like, is it possible to reverse... Um, sea level rise or reverse uh, adverse uh, climate effects often leads people to think of kind of large engineering solutions. You know, let's try and come up with geoengineering or ways to reverse. I, I think that's, again, a really dangerous uh, road to, to, to go down. I think there is um, enough evidence to suggest that some amount of um, sea level rise, some amount of changes in, in, in weather patterns, etc., are inevitable. And uh, we need to focus on much more people-centered, so, uh, okay. social-centered. So a, a a little um, bit of help here and there it can make some lives better. And we're going to wrap the program up in just a minute. Alexandra, let me come to you. Um, European stability is part of your job title. Uh, can you see, whether it's Europe or elsewhere in the uh, what they call the, the developed world, that this will be a destabilizing factor uh, in the next 10 years, which, of course, is where we're looking with our 2020 vision program? No, I don't see major displacement in these hundreds or million, billions of people on the move in the next 10 years. But I do think that the industrialist countries in the framework of the fight 
against climate change have responsibilities towards poorer and more vulnerable countries. Uh, you can uh, sometimes prevent disasters, for example, to flood um, defense systems. Uh, you can also help people find livelihoods whose livelihoods are currently threatened. Yeah. And here, I think that industrialized countries have to take their responsibilities much more seriously, as they also have to take the fight against climate change more seriously and reduce emissions, which and, is and, and we have, listen, as it should. We have heard that on many occasions on this program. Listen, I appreciate your time, each and every one of you. Aisha, Errol, Alexandra. Uh, good to have your thoughts on this. Uh, we are talking about 145 million plus people who may be on the move because of climate change. Climate migrants, they are being referred to as, but each and every single one of those 145 million plus will have their own very personal story to tell about the way the world is changing. From me, David Foster, from my guest, thank you very much indeed for watching uh, this 2020 Vision program here on Roundtable. Hope to have your company next time. Goodbye.